in some ways, in some ways, April is the cruelest month. Um, the commemoration of uh, the Holocaust is generally in April, although the date changes from one year to the next because um, uh, it's uh, noted on the Hebrew calendar, the Jewish calendar. But April is also the time um, when the Rwandan genocide took place and also um, the Armenian genocide. So April is, in some ways, a very cruel month. Uh, but something exciting is going to be happening, and um, we have someone here who is doing remarkable work, who's going to tell you all about something that's going to happen that you can participate in. Gabe? Good afternoon. Um, my name is Gabe Farrick. I'm 14 years old. And for the last three years, I have worked on projects to fight human rights abuses and raise money and awareness for genocide victims and survivors. I'm proud to say that so far, I've raised over $30,000 for this important cause. <laughs> last year, 100 adults and children of different backgrounds and religions marched through our city streets with me on a summer morning to help raise awareness and money to end genocide in Darfur. We are making progress, but until there is peace, we must all continue to fight genocide in the world. Please help me raise awareness, support, and hope by participating in a three-mile Walk to End Genocide on Sunday, April 18, 2010. This event is sponsored by me and the Social Action Committee of Nation Shomri Torah. All the proceeds will benefit Jewish World Watch. They are a great nonprofit organization that works to end genocide and help survivors. And we are fortunate that Third District County Supervisor Shirley Zane Rabbi George Gittleman, and Holocaust survivor Lillian Judd will share inspirational remarks before the walk. The walk is a family event. Last year, the walk raised almost $10,000. Imagine what we can do this year if we all gather our friends, family, and coworkers and pledge to raise funds and march together to fight genocide. If you'd like to participate in the walk, please go to www.walktoendgenocide.org. If, if you need to write that down, it's walktoendgenocide.org and click on the Santa Rosa Walk link. There is an Alliance team that you can join. If you can't make the walk, you can make a donation by sponsoring me or another walker. It will really help me if you can register to walk by the end of March so I can order enough new walk t-shirts for everyone pre-registered. This is a powerful way for our community to make a statement about our commitment to ending genocide. I hope you will participate and help spread the word. Together we will continue to make a difference. Thank you. information in the sections. Veronica, one of your classmates, is going to have flyers for us. Um, yeah, and you can sign up with her after lecture today. Um, we're waiting now for uh, Mathilde. She, she comes from a long way. It's not, it's not coming from Rwanda. It's just Sacramento. <laughs> um, but there's another walk that's going on, and we have someone here from uh, the Armenian community. You see, I told you that April was uh, the cruelest month, and in April we also uh, commemorate uh, the Armenian genocide, and this year will be the 95th um, anniversary, as it were, of the Armenian genocide. So, David, would you like to say a word? Thank you, Myrna. Uh, first, I want to just commend uh, the young gentleman here, the 14-year-old, uh, for doing what he's doing. Gonna, that was a round of applause. Uh, very, very impressive. Uh, my name is David Ojaki, and uh, I grew up um, learning from my grandfather, who was a survivor of the Armenian Genocide, uh, just of the atrocities that happened. And that's the one, these atrocities, these crimes against humanity, are something that bind all of these ethnicities together. You know, whether it's the Jewish community, the Rwanda community, uh, you name it. Uh, all of the ethnicities that have, that have suffered these crimes against humanity, uh, humanity have this common um, ancestry and common um, heritage. 
And one thing that we're doing, it's a walk also, um, it's not necessarily raising money uh, like that, which is a great, great concept, but it's, we're doing a walk on the Golden Gate Bridge on April 24, um, from 11.30 until 2.30 p.m. We'll have everyone gather. There's a dirt lot on Lincoln Avenue in San Francisco. Uh, we'll have signs and everything. We'll have everyone gather there at 11.30. The walk will go from 12 until 2, and the extra half hour after gives, gives, up, gives us enough time to um, kind of get off the bridge and uh, leave together. Um, so what we're hoping for this walk is to bring all these ethnicities together to walk in solidarity in honor of their 95th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, as well as all of these other crimes against humanity and genocides and in honor of those that were lost in them. So uh, we'd love to uh, have a group from Sonoma State come out and um, uh, join us. Uh, we'll have t-shirts unifying everybody. Um, and I have a flyer here that I believe these postcard flyers will be made available uh, through the department and uh, through Christine. Um, so more information is, is out there. Uh, thank you. And, um, you know, thank, I'm glad, I'm happy to be here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Think about it and read it next week, and we'll make sure that Matilda gets it. <coughs> we'll just kind of combine it all and send it to the chat. Okay, the time has come to introduce you to Mathilde Mukatabana. Mathilde has a graduate degrees in social work. Um, she is on the faculty at Consumnes College. She teaches about history, African history, and genocide. And she also has been instrumental in starting a school of social work in Rwanda, in Kigali. I imagine you can imagine yourself at how important it is to have trained mental health people working in uh, Rwanda. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit um, unusual in the sense that we're not necessarily going to learn all of the details today on Rwandan genocide, but Mathilde is going to talk about 
what has happened in post-genocidal Rwanda, what has to happen for a society to survive after members of the society were engaged in such a brutal genocide. And so Mathilde, who is very active um, and very involved um, and is Rwandan, um, is going to talk to you about the steps that have been taken in, in Rwanda to try and rebuild a fractured society. So without further ado, I ask you to welcome Mathilde Mukatamana. Thank you again. It's always a wonderful time for me to be here at uh, Sonoma State. Uh, I, I can say for sure that it has been a second family for us. It's a, it's a community. And I think again, if you, people who are uh, Mirna, Christine, <laughs> David, Rory, and, you know, uh, you know, Barbara, who have invited me last time, and Hans, uh, thank you so much. We, it's very difficult to talk about genocide per se. I was going to show a couple of images, and I'm not going to go there. You probably studied about genocides, and what I say is to remind, I mean to remind you the incredible loss that the country of Rwanda went through for three months. We are talking about a million people dying. And for the last 16 years, we are celebrating or commemorating, not celebrating the 16th uh, year of genocide in Rwanda. Progress has been, as a matter of fact, when people go to Rwanda, they say, it's incredible, it's incredible progress. Infrastructure has been rebuilt. For the last couple of years, Rwanda has been seen as a model of development by the World Bank, by whatever you are talking about. But obviously, when we talk about reconciliation and reconstruction, uh, reconstructing a wounded society, I think it will take more generations that uh, we can really talk about right now. Uh, we have many different challenges. But today what I'm going to talk about briefly will be the attempts at reconstruction. Uh, and I have, first of all, to say it's a multidimensional initiative, as you know. Uh, we have the political will to bring people together, not to necessarily the one that the survivors are pushing for. So you have many different ways people are trying to rebuild the country. Just to give you an idea, what we have been doing and helping us to deal with uh, the incredible economic toll taken in the region where genocide took place, and what Sonoma has done and other societies and communities have done are helping in rebuilding the country. You know, because we can talk about reconciliation, but when people are in, in a helpless and hopeless situation, it's very difficult to talk about coming together as people. You have to address the basic needs to give hope. You know, that, that's as simple as that. So economic development, organizing communities, community organizing, and so on and so forth are part of the reconstruction. Briefly, if I can talk about what the country has done, that is, is in the, 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 I mean the international media right now, they talk about the whole notion of reconciliation. You can talk about anything, but reconciliation is the one. Rwandan genocide is a domestic genocide. We are not talking about people who are of different ethnic groups or different religions or, or different ethnicity and so on and so forth. Most people were part of the same family. So you are talking about really bringing the family together, sometimes, in reality. You know, uh, when you talk about Hutu, Tutsi, and Tua, those were social groups that eventually became racial groups. They became racialized through the, the, a very dark history of our country. When we look at the colonialism, we look at the subsequent administrations. They built a case for racial categories instead of looking at what society was. And that's what people are dealing with now. You go to the country and people are talking about one group. You know, we, don't, we are not allowed to talk about Hutu and Tutsi. And, you know, it doesn't mean that people don't know. 
you know that the people who are alive are the Hutus and the ones who died are Tutsis. And you find it in every physical way. Their houses are torn apart. You don't find anybody. You find one survivor. You know, and, and that's how the country is trying to do that. They say maybe the future generations are going to forget about Tutsi, Hutu, and Tua and try to rebuild. But if we look at the reconciliation, and I don't know if they are able to, uh, to open my PowerPoint. I can, yeah, let, let me start with that briefly. Just if you can put a couple of images of genocide and then we'll go to the second one, if it's okay. Yeah. I promise next time I won't rely on PowerPoint. I just come in. <laughs> but um, there are a few things that the country has done that is an incredible way to look at the society. And one was, You've heard about uh, gachacha. And I'm going to talk about gachacha is the, the customary type of way to render justice. OK. Gachacha was initiated a couple of years after genocide was done in Rwanda. And it was a way to bring it together Let's leave it alone for now. <laughs> yeah. It was a way to, to combine both justice and reconciliation in mind. What is Gachacha? Gachacha was built around the idea that people can take care of their own solution, I mean their own problems with local solutions. And the cornerstone of, of Gachacha is to empower the people themselves. And I have to begin by saying that there are many limitations to gachacha. Gachacha is supposed to be justice, because we believe that the prerequisite to reconciliation has to be justice. You know, you have, you have to understand that we have people who are more than 100,000 people who killed or who were involved in killing. And when genocide ended, we didn't have more than five judges left. There are no judges. We don't have any attorneys. We don't have any, even prisons don't exist. There, you know, really the crime in Rwanda was pretty low. When you talk about genocide, if you go and study the Rwandan society, we hardly had any big crimes where people had to go to jail to stay for a long time. So in each prefecture, prefecture was, was like a province. They had one prison, one. Now we are thinking in terms of a place where maybe 10,000 people were killed. And usually when they, they, usually people were trying people, it was not about killing. It was about uh, stealing a cow. It was doing those kind of things. So you can imagine the plight or the challenges facing the people in the post-genocide Rwanda. What are we going to do with the people who have killed if we are really trying to rebuild the society? And about 2 million people came back from uh, Congo. They came back from Tanzania. Rwanda opened the borders. They said, they come back. Even if we have killed, we are going to deal with the problem in the country. Because of the insecurity it was building on the border. So they came back. And that's the main reason that people, you know, if you don't render justice immediately, it will never happen. It will never happen. And in the case of our country, especially with the infrastructure we had, the poverty that is part of that country, there was no way you could try the people. But also we understood that without any sense of justice, what we are trying to achieve to bring and to heal the wounded society will never happen. You had to have some kind of justice. And the Gachacha was initiated. And Gachacha by itself has many limitations. You know, those standards that you call Western standards of justice don't exist. You know, you don't have anyone to defend you. You don't have any attorney when you are facing your people. But it's a value-based type of justice. And just to tell you, there's no perfect justice if you think about it. I mean, 
when you think about any kind of justice, there is no perfect justice, including here. But in the Dogachacha process, that value-based system is the number one to bring people together. It's a communal thing. With the night was rehabilitation, not so much punishment and retribution. So that's the, 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 the basic foundation for that. With an understanding that once people have been tried, they can rejoin society, they can pay their debts, and eventually they can rejoin society. And obviously, not everyone is happy with that because it's a, it's a very imperfect, because the people who are judging the people are chosen by the people. The majority of the survivors are the people connected to the killing, meaning that even the type of justice they are going to, to deliver is going to be very uh, imperfect. But for survivors of genocide, it's better than no justice at all. Uh, people were able to bury their dead. They were able to uh, create some kind of regeneration. Even in that kind of misery, but people are able to bring something that can make sense for themselves and move forward. You know, I, when I tell you about that, I'm not really a very big fan of Gachacha because I went to Gachacha three times already for my own family. Last time I went because this guy who had killed my parents said he had died where he had put them. So I had to go back to Rwanda. We dug the whole mountain for three hours, five hours, we didn't find anything. He died again, 15 years. After. So the gachacha thing, people use and misuse them, and it's normal because that's, you know, uh, you are looking at the people who are using it for their own survival in Rwandan society, whether they are perpetrators or, or victims are wounded. You know, they don't have any kind of social outlet, meaning that if gachacha is going to be a forum for them to survive or to maintain themselves, they are going to lie in it. And, uh, but that's a system we have. One of the most fascinating things that Rwanda has developed that we are developing more is what is called the Mihigo. I was going to show you briefly, but uh, and, and it's really, I have to tell you when you prepare with something in mind and you don't see it, it doesn't become the same, but it's okay. Imihigo is, Imihigo is I-M-I-H-I-G-O. So Imhigo was a traditional ritual where people came together to compete. It's a competition. So right now what they are trying to do with Imhigo, uh, the Mihigo is helping to decentralize the Rwandan affairs. So they go in different places and they bring each, you know, they rank what they have to compete in, justice, economic development, gender, and so on and so forth. And they have to sign a contract. They sign a contract with the local authorities. The local authority has to sign with the president. And they have to go five, five months to show the progress in that particular region. So what it has achieved in, in Rwandan government or in Rwandan society is that it empowers the poor people. You know, and, and people have really to see what can benefit their communities including coming together. So it has helped better than Dogachacha, for instance, because on one hand, you are developing yourself, you are producing, you are building for widows, you are putting uh, schools in certain places, and you are also judging people and see how you can you know, bring them back to society. So I have to tell you that my region was ranked last, last, last May, they ranked the regions and they said the one in the south didn't. And the main reason was that the people are not really staying in the same place. There was so much killing that most people prefer to go to Burundi to escape Gachacha. Meaning that if you don't stick around, there's no one who is working on those intracommunal and the type of development basis in, in the country. So, so Imihigo has been uh, promoted. The other thing that is very positive that we are, we are using in terms of reconciliation uh, in the country has been the incredible promotion of women. You know, that, this is something very positive to happen in the country because women, uh, if I can say the, the people who have been abused, uh, 
misused, who have gotten the biggest blunt of genocide, they were women. Many were raped. The survivors were raped. Many are infected with this. Uh, and yet, they have really put aside whatever to build more communities, to bring families together. You lost your children. You took in many children. One of the dosena that Mirna was telling you about, what they call sisterhood uh, city, we have 56 houses. And the women who live in those houses have taken in other children who are not their children. They lost their children, you know, but they are building other small communities and, you know, so it has been that. Women are doing a lot, helped by the promotion of women in general, the new solution guarantee many uh, increased powers by women. Right now, the biggest ministries are kept by women. Uh, Rwanda has the highest rate of women in the parliament in the world. In the world, 53% are women. So meaning that it's changing in terms of even when you talk about reconciliation. Uh, the Ministry of Reconciliation and Rehabilitation is a woman. Foreign Affairs is a woman. Uh, environment is a woman. So all these things are helping. And I'm not sexist. I'm not saying that women can do better than that, but women are the ones who are carrying the blunt of development. Yay. Oh, yeah. I, I just want to show a, a couple of things, probably, that I've said. <laughs> you can ignore the one on genocide. Maybe you can show the, the one and I, I can give. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Oh. Do you want to pass them through quickly and then I will see the other one? You know, it, you know, for the people who have never seen any movie on Rwanda, it, it's it, those were the common scene in Rwanda in 1994 and after. You know, you, you, you can imagine that even today we are still burying dead, dead people. Even today, 16 years later, you can imagine it was just a burial ground. And churches were not respected. You can see the cardinal in Rwanda. It's, uh, sometimes you thought they were cabbage. Because you find so many heads in the fields, you thought it, they were cabbage. You know, they were, that were in uh, the place. These are people going back and not finding anything at all. <coughs> the country was completely destroyed. And um, this is the memorial uh, in Kigali that was built uh, thanks to uh, President Clinton. He's the one who funded the, the, the memorial center. So the majority of the people living in Rwanda now are children. The, most of the survivors, the, the, more than 70% are children 18 and younger. So you don't really find older people. These are a few of the, the children we, we found in Mayaga and that place. No electricity, so what we do, we use those kind of traders. Yeah. yeah. These are volunteers from the Sacramento area that went to Rwanda to help, and you know, a few, quite a few. And this is a school. Uh, this is the region. It used to be very developed. So when you look at the, the, the countryside, now it's like no house ever existed in those places. But Right now, most people are really burying people. That, that, that's the place that we've, uh, we've built. 
yeah, for, for the children over there in uh, Mayaga. And even in the countryside, they usually they put pictures of the robbed ones. They try to build the memorials, even in the area, in, in the rural areas. Uh, and it's very difficult to find pictures because the pictures were completely torn. I mean, we don't have any pictures. They don't exist, but unless you had them somewhere. So wherever you go, children. You know, in, on one hand, it can be a challenge, but also maybe an opportunity, because you are thinking in terms of uh, future generations, if we are talking about what is happening next. So this was last year. That, that's, okay, if you, you, you see that picture, you see the, the, the girls graduating in that school, and you can imagine the day of the graduation is the day they are burying their people. You know, so it's the day of graduation. They are wearing, you know, so that, that was pretty much. Yeah, and I think for genocide, we leave it there for now. Yeah, whenever you go into the countryside, you find those things. It's a remember people who, who died from genocide. If you see that color, it's because there's a mass grave. So throughout the country, you find those kind of stuff. All this, this was used to be now 20,000 bodies. And this was near the bishop in Butare. The bishop who ran away because he was wanted for genocide, he, he found asylum in Rome. So that's why, for instance, right now, you know, people or groups are pushing the Pope at least to apologize for what, what happened in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. uh, with an understanding that if, for instance, the Pope had written a letter, just one, saying that people should stop, because really the Catholic authority and then the, the, the power structure were intertwined. It could have made a big difference. But the, the bishops, the, the, the priests were involved in the genocide. They were part of this thing. So, but this was a school. It used to be a school. All of this. And, and they came to the bodies. It's, when you go over there, you see the, the bodies. Including here. You know, it's, uh, is it a memorial? They left them as a memorial because, uh, you know, in the 94 already people were saying it didn't happen. Yeah. So, what the government did was to leave whatever. The way people died is where they are, the way they, they were cut with machetes. Even people who were pregnant, they are still open over there. So, you can still see the. Uh, yeah. This guy has lost all his family and Behind him is a place full of bodies, and he feels more comfortable there than with the people. So when you go there, you find him. For the last 15 years, when you go, you go, you'll see that guy standing in front. And yet, you know, the water, usually you talk about water. Rwanda is very beautiful, and I'm not saying it because I'm biased, but <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, it's really beautiful. And I have my friend here, Alan. Uh, see, because he was in the rescue, he was an American who was there in 94. You know, he came with me today, but he knows the place. I used to go to school here. It's one of the most beautiful places in, uh, in Rwanda. But Water came to represent something bad because we know people are buried there. You know, many people were dumped in the water, whether it was a river or lake or whatever. Yeah. We are thinking of. Yeah, and you know, all these children, either they were born during genocide because even the survivors of genocide who were young, 12, 11, 10, they were violated. So now we have children who are born after genocide, but who are part of uh, the same programs that we have started. So uh, this one is an orphan, but the most positive person I've ever seen. I like to take his picture because he's, uh, he's very inspiring. You know, he's, he's someone who can do many things, and uh, I can't. That's why we really have hope. We have hope that eventually things will. Uh, will work out. 
But if you, if you can go to the second video, that would be nice. Uh, quickly. So I just, you can, if you want, you can do fast because I'll talk while you are doing that. Yeah, by looking at this, these images, you can imagine the cost of reconstruction. You know, and yet, A friend of mine was asking, how can you, you know, I mean, what kind of reconciliation are you talking about? You know, what are you going to, to, to start? Where are you going to begin? You know, I just, you can go through our skewed history. We had uh, a royalty, colonization came, and then people were put in a different category. And then the new administration, like this president, felt that the Tutsi and the Hutu were two different categories, and they can't live together. So it was built until 1994. You know, the, and the problem was that we, we couldn't se separate the country. And this is the group in power, and I want to read this sentence because this is really what the country has embarked on for the last uh, 16 years. This is President Kagame, and he believes that it's our <coughs> mission right now to build this society. He made he said we have the responsibility, and no one is equipped to do that. It's really by, you know, you try whatever works, and then you, you move forward. This is one of the biggest challenges. We have all these people coming back. You've probably seen images when they were going to, to, uh, to uh, Congo, Tanzania, and then there was a war between Rwanda and Congo based upon this, because these people carried with them their weapons. As a matter of fact, even today is the biggest threat to peace and stability in the region. A group called FDRR, because they are intending to invade again Rwanda by military means. So Rwanda brought them back. On one hand, you have these orphans, you have those people coming back, you don't have any, any kind of uh, arbitration among the two groups. You know, they come back on their villages, they, they live side by side by the people who, who have lost their loved ones. This woman, I know her, but she, they took the picture when she was looking at the people coming back. Coming back. And she was saying, go ahead and kill us right now. Why do we have to wait until, I, I need, you know, I prefer to die when the wound is still fresh. I've lost my people, so I prefer to die right now. So they see people coming back. And that's the reality. Individual reconciliation has taken place in the villages because you don't have a choice. You know, people go and they rely on each other for production, they do this and that. And I have a cousin who was telling us, these are the people I call when, you know, I need people. So eventually we have to come together regardless of how things are. So that, that's the reality. However, one of the biggest threats to any sense of reconciliation in the country is what is taking place right now. Because especially starting with 19, uh, 2007, 2008, there has been a growing wave of negation, negating that the genocide in Rwanda actually took place the way it has been portrayed. Exactly. And I have to tell you that the people feeding that kind of ideology are people from here. These are people in the academia who can actually go and present papers, put all those kind of stuff saying that the genocide didn't happen. You know, I have to tell you, you've probably, how many people have seen Hotel Rwanda? You, you know, when Hotel Rwanda came, as survivors, we were happy because at least, even though sometimes the accuracy was not there, it was a Hollywood movie, but at least it put in people's psyche what took place in Rwanda, right? Mm -hmm. And it was speaking of a Hutu who was a good person, who saved his neighbor. It was a symbol of all the Hutus who helped their fellow Tutsi. But when you look at what Rusesabajina has done right now, 
you know, uh, you know, I was, uh, this week I was at Brown University because we were exactly talking about that, because they have been organizing those panels of these people coming and talking about genocide is, as a matter of fact, they said Tutsi genocide never took place. It didn't. It didn't. If there are people who died, then I give you the material. If the people died, the majority were the Hutus who died. Or it was a self-inflicted genocide. Yeah, it was self-inflicted. So the, 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 there are a couple of, if you move forward, I'll show you a couple of arguments that were offered and the people saying that because it's just, and for me, for me, that's what is scary. Because that kind of ideology goes back to Rwanda, feeds the extremist point of view, and unless the country can have some kind of memory that is bringing them together. There's no way you can really come together as people. Because you have at least to know what to took place before you can move forward. And it's not happening. And the biggest thing has been a growing wave of revisionism. No, I'm not even saying revisionism, but you know. Challenge the, the denial, it's multidimensional. We have the Hutu power, especially the people who are based in Congo, uh, who are trying to invade. Active diaspora, you know, what happened in the, before genocide was that the Hutus were going to many foreign countries because they got scholarships. Tutsis couldn't go. They had cut any kind of educational opportunities for Tutsis in the country. So these are the people who have had the chance to go in the academia or who are lawyers or who are doctors who are sending that kind of point of view in the media. You know, we have them at Emory University, Michigan University, we have them at Minnesota. As a matter of fact, in two weeks I'll go to Minnesota because we have that panel. Once again, many people who are claiming that the genocide didn't take place. So that's, you, you can imagine, and, and then political opponents. One day they wake up, they say the new government is a bad government, it's an imperialistic government, and it gives them the needed uh, ammunition to deny genocide. As if, you know, even if you are against the today's government, you can't claim that genocide didn't take place. So that's the biggest problem we have. And in certain Western countries, we, a good development has been that the president of France now, Rwanda and France have re, restored political, uh, political uh, relations. But until recently, for instance, Francois Mitterrand, of France, when he was talking about the genocide in Rwanda, said, what to genocide? Are you talking about to genocide? As if saying everyone killed each other. So, you know, what's the big deal? Those were ethnic or whatever. So what I'm saying, at least in France, right now they have arrested one of the key uh, genocide uh, person, you know, two weeks ago meaning that at least they are turning around and, and with building that kind of bridge, maybe it's going to do the thing. And mostly academicians. So if you move forward, maybe I can show a couple of things. The main arguments are this. Most, like Christopher Black, who is a, Christopher Black is a lawyer. He's an attorney for genocide perpetu in Tanzania. So he has built the whole case saying that genocide in Rwanda is a myth. There's no such a thing. Genocide didn't take place. And as a matter of fact, he calls it a conspiracy between the United States, Ugandan government, and the Rwandan government. Yeah, he, he calls it a conspiracy. When you go and Google Christopher Black, that's what he says. And he has, you know, I mean, it's understandable. He's defending the people who have killed, so he'll come up with all these things. But, or double genocide. RPF and Kabula are responsible, Hutus are the true victims of genocide. One of the, if you go on, on Alan Stam, who is an eminent professor, he's uh, from Michigan, he has even a YouTube talking about that. He said, statistically speaking, you can say that the Tutsis died. The people who were dying were Hutus, but people masqueraded them as, as Tutsi. You know, so he, he's using all these statistics you can't even really start to understand. And as I said, 
big conspiracy including Uganda, US, UK, and RPF to control the Great Lakes. Because they are talking about Congo, they are talking about, you know, the wealth in those countries. So they wanted to control the whole Great Lakes and they manufactured that genocide. So let's make a genocide to be able to do those things. So as you can see, it's really one of the toughest thing. And the Hutus in Rwanda, especially the ones who are facing the tribunal, the ones who are willing to actually come together are empowered by this, by this ideology. And when you have someone like Ruse Sabajina who, who is going around talking about Rwandan society like we have never seen, remotely reason what people have seen. He's talking about a slave society where Tutsis were the, the masters and the Hutus were, were the slaves. And obviously, when there is slavery, there is also resistance. So he calls it resistance. It's really, you know, the Tutsis. The Tutsis fought for this. And you go back, but he's doing it because he wants something to resonate with African Americans here. Because he's trying to build the case where people can understand it within those lenses. People like Cynthia McKinney, who is a congresswoman, who understood before what was taking place in the country. When you look at how she has changed, you understand, and, and Jesse Jackson as well. You know, and it's because of people like Ruse Sabajina. He's, you know, if you go and show the, the, the next image, I think you can. You know, Ruse Sabajina got a medal from the White House. He's a hero. And you try, this is a stamp. Devonport, who is from Notre Dame, who, who is saying that, that genocide never took place? You are to, and then Cynthia. The stuff that have been written lately, if you go and, even if you put denying genocide in Rwanda, you see these people. And strangely enough, the same bibliography they use, the same sources are, are, you know, they get it from the same place. These are manufactured, and that's what we are facing. And to tell you the truth, when you say, uh, reconciliation and bringing people together, this is the biggest one. Because there's no way you can come together if you don't build a certain collective memory or corrective memory, because our history is completely skewed. So, and uh, I think maybe I should leave it here so you can, because I know we started a little bit late and if you have anything to ask me, I can. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Could you just briefly tell uh, people what your role was when you were Please. Beginning sometime in April 1994, when I was asked by the U.S. Embassy in uh, Uganda to check on bodies in Lake Victoria, and subsequently we found 10,000 bodies in the lake coming down the Kagera River from Uganda, sorry, Rwanda. I realized there was a problem. I was, after counting the bodies, I was then asked by our government to volunteer to continue penetrating Rwanda as there was nobody else going in there. There were no other foreigners going in. And our government needed statistics on what was happening. In other words, body counts, where the various armies were located, and uh, to see as I could gather as much intelligence as I could uh, during a very dynamic time in Rwanda. Uh, this I did, counted a lot of bodies for our government, uh, rescued a few, did not save about a million, had no support. have paid a terrible price for my efforts to help women and children survive 
when there were nobody, there was nobody else from the Western world or any part of the world going in. I've been offered a chance by Matilda and the Tutsi people to block any effort by the Tutsi, sorry, by the Hutu people to rewrite history, making it sound like it was the Hutu who died in Rwanda, not the Tutsi people. I never counted a Hutu body. I never had a Tutsi brag about killing a Hutu. It was always the Hutu bragging about killing the Tutsi. Brag with their machetes glistening with blood time after time after time. Watching multiple rapes take place in front of me. Rapes like you can't believe. Violent rapes by numerous soldiers. Killers all at the same time. Terrible things done to the men. Just animals. When society breaks down as it did in Rwanda, there are some of us in this room who will demand that the social order remain intact. Unfortunately, there are many in this room who would enjoy the breakdown of society and would indulge in the worst of atrocities. That's what I've come away with from Rwanda and other places in Africa. I've been in Africa for 30 years flying. I'm a pilot. So with that, I'll turn this back over to Matilda. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. I know that's pretty. I just want to thank you so much for coming, Matilda. Can your guest tell us who he is? My name is Alan Campbell. Alan Campbell. Right. And I just want to honor you so much, Matilda. I have a sense of the anguish and the rage of having to fight for your basic, simple reality. And I just want you to know that I believe you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> one of, one of the thing. things that, you know, I said that April was among the cruelest months. But one of the things that we're going to find out in April, and it's not to diminish what we just heard, and you will learn it in section, is that there are very large movements to deny all genocide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Every April, Armenians have to fight to get people to recognize what happened to the Armenian people. The Turks refuse to admit that they committed this genocide, even though there is a spectacular amount of documentary evidence. We all know, and I'm sure that you have heard, people saying, the Holocaust, that didn't happen. How could that happen? That never happened. So, um, not only do we share a great tragedy, but we share this mm -hmm. injustice of denial. And I would hope that as students, not only would you be able to say that's not true, what happened in Rwanda did happen, what happened in Armeni in, in Arme to the Armenians happened, and what happened in the Holocaust happened. Mm -hmm. So, any questions? Yeah, Larry. As a matter of fact, I had brought it in a case to show it, oh. a small part of Dogachacha. Yeah, it's one of the best. It's, it shows a little bit more complexity <coughs> about what happened in Rwanda, but also about the family and, and the split. It's a, it's a very good movie. If you haven't seen anything on Rwanda, sometimes in April is, is a very good one. It's on your, it's on your film list? Sometimes in April. in April. If I might say, this is also another excellent film done by a Belgian uh, mm -hmm. photojournalist called My Neighbor, My Killer, yeah. where it deals with Kachacha and the Rwandese women who have gone through so much and the cowardly, 
Hutu men who deny, deny, deny that they had any part in the genocide. But unfortunately for the men, the women were their next door neighbors in many cases. They lived in the same villages. I would like you to remember that um, the Holocaust happened over a period of five years, six years, and that what happened in Rwanda happened in three months, 800,000 people. Three months. Yes. Um, I was wondering two questions. One, what is the agenda of the American scholars in the Western news? What are they trying to do in their denial efforts? Do you know? What is their, what is it, what's their agenda? What are they trying to do that's causing them to, to undertake this huge injustice academically? That's one question. And then I had another question about what's happening in country <laughs> as people are being released from their incarceration and how is it going in the towns and villages as victims and perpetrators are now living next door to each other again right. as this happens. The first one, I would say, you know, Rwanda and genocide are a fascinating thing. Mm. It's a subject, you know, I mean, when you have something like that. But one is that really people didn't believe, to begin with, that this was more than a tribal war. And, and, and it goes back, I mean, you can find any, any kind of origin, but also the way people view Africa in general. The way Africa is viewed. It, it can't, you know, it can't be in the same league and, as, for instance, the Holocaust. You know, even though they can deny Holocaust, but they can see, yeah, it took place here. You know, but in a case, you know, even people of goodwill, you know, they began by saying, who is killing who? Even today, even today, people will say, who, to, to, who? No one knows who's who. Really, there's a basic lack of knowledge about Africa to begin with, really. Okay. And because Africa doesn't count that much. You know, usually you, you, you have a knowledge of something when you have an interest, a vested interest in, in, in the knowledge. So Africa, in general, has been always of a second order. To give you an example, there's uh, this guy in Sacramento B. I already know him, he was a commentary guy, Crouch. Mm -hmm. So he wrote this article about Rwanda, and he, the article was wonderful. But he was saying, you know, you can imagine, for instance, if we go around and we cut uh, heads like the Tutsi did to Hutus, he didn't even understand who's who. So when I wrote, I said, this is the second, it's like victimization all over again. Here you are, you are sitting there and people say, oh, and, and uh, you see it all the time you go and they say, where are you from? From Rwanda. So what are you? And you know very well that the question behind is this, are you the killer or the victim? Uh, you know, so it's always that kind of way because of lack of understanding and in a way, as a matter of fact, when you, you think about Rwanda now, it has been in the news, but before then, how many people knew about Rwanda? Nothing. So even the analysis coming from that, people have to put it in an equation of something they understand better. Here you have this majority, especially if you say, okay, they were the oppressed and the oppressor. And then eventually, the ones who were oppressed took over and maybe they killed or the oppressor killed again. No one is going back to see that the Tutsis have never been to power in Rwanda since 19, uh, well, since colonialism. That was it. But, you know, if you talk about the king, the king who was elected from the, the Tutsis, doesn't mean that all the Tutsis were in power either. Even then, even then you had a, a feudal system like any other system. There was no ethnic warfare prior to colonialism, people pretty much moved around. They were able to build a society based upon, you know, mutual, you know, understanding. But now they are building a case, and you have to understand also to put it in general context, 19th century Europe was really fascinated by race. Mm -hmm. You remember when people were ranking race, so when the Germans, Germany came to Rwanda, so they, they saw people in terms of race, and they ranked. 
And that, and then Rwandans themselves studied to see themselves within those lenses, unfortunately. So, so it led to what we have right now. The narrative is a faulty one. You know, when we begin with, the, that's why the history of Rwanda has been stopped. You know, they, they've studied at least to, to try to use different things to rewrite the history because, you know, when you think about it, it was written from the perspective of the people who took over 1959. Yeah, to fit whatever agenda. And then you have these people in Tanzania who are having a world stage. If you look at Stam, the guy from Notre Dame, the, uh, Devonport or Stam from Michigan, they say exactly what Christopher Black who is defending the Hutus is saying. There's no difference. Even if you look at the, uh, the, the, the material they are using, you know. And then you go around, you find that there are many Hutu in the academia who are feeding them. You know, these are, so it goes around, and, and, and it's going all over the world. Yeah. So what they are getting in, they are being published. They are saying, finally, we got the story straight. Those people really didn't have it right, and, you know, they are writing whatever they want to write. But they don't understand the devastating impact, especially today, when you think in terms of what they, and what you said is right, it's true. With the genocide comes the denial, so we are pretty much prepared, but... For a country that is a poor country like us, with no means for people to go around and try to do it. it can, Ten years from now, we might find another story about Rwanda. You know, that's my fear as a person. Mm -hmm. But the rest, I think you ask another question, I do very brief. It's very difficult, and it depends on where you live. There are communities that were able to rebuild together. <coughs> You know, and it depends on their ways to be, uh, to have an economically sound pro program, who have built the cooperatives, and so on and so forth. Other places, survivors are still being killed. As a matter of fact, it's one of the biggest problems we have. You know, when you, you are living with people who came back who are not really remorseful, you find people who are killed, even now. So. It's, it's, it's really variable depending upon which place in the country you are in. Yeah. Are, there, are there any countries that are um, in Rwanda and offering some positive aid? Or is uh, aid right now, you know, strangely enough, the United States or the, when you go to Rwanda right now, they say the most improved country economically. The World Bank has, has said Rwanda is doing very well. And it's true, when you land there, you, you wouldn't, aside from the memorials everywhere, you would say that Rwanda, Rwanda is fine. But people like Clinton, uh, Rwanda now has, they, they are, they are, it's the first environmentally friendly country. They are having the, the conference on environment in Rwanda next year. So they are, you know, for instance, to give you a, a tiny example, you can't see any plastic. They have to do all the stuff, so they are trying to start from scratch and try to do it right. So they are doing alternative energy. There's a big company in the United States, uh, I think that it is going to do what they call the Jatropha plant. They've been given land just to produce alternative type of energy. So they are doing very well in terms of the, and the Great Britain as well is there. Uh, but mostly the Rwandans themselves, I think, and that's one of the philosophy. They say, when you come to help, we want you to come as partners. Because we don't have, want any kind of solution engineered by people from outside. You know, so if you are coming, but it's a mutual type of thing where you can get from us as well, it's quite all right. So, because you know very well when you, give, you get a handout, sometimes it can come with, uh, you know, many different strings. things. Yeah, strings, yeah. building is really, really admirable. Um, I always bring myself back to hearing, it, it makes me furious to hear about the revisionism and the, and the denial. And it, it always brings me back to, unless you get 100% reconciliation or reparation, when does genocide end? I don't think it does. It doesn't. Yeah. You know, you, you are right, <laughs> really. You know, it's, 
I don't know. You know, personally, the, the problem, the other, we have many challenges. For instance, even though in the country they are trying to bring groups together, we have been unsuccessful in doing that in the United States or other places. You know, for instance, right now, I have to tell you that there's no single group of Hutu I'm working with. Even though I open up, you know, I, but it's, it's difficult for me. I don't want to start a project. If anyone starts it, maybe I'll, do, I'll go. But uh, before genocide, we were an open group. You know, they were brothers and sisters. We were really together. We were trying to transfer problems we were going on in the country. We said we are lucky to be here. If any, we, have, we should be the, the solution instead of being part of the problem. Right? But then the genocide happened. These guys who are in the same environment, who go to school or who are teaching, they heard about our parents being killed in large numbers. Before they could extend the human area, you know, here you are, you have lived together, I'm with you. Because in my country something is taking place, you know I've lost all my people. Instead of at least having the courtesy to call me, and say, I'm sorry, and then go on your political campaign. The same night, they started the rampage of going around saying, we are the ones who killed people. And these are, they were our friends. We are talking about friends. So for me, it has been a very difficult thing to move from that, because the human equation was missing during that time. So even though in the country you find people and those initiatives of people trying to bridge the gap, it has been very difficult in foreign countries uh, because maybe, you know, eventually maybe it will happen, but not now. So it has been a very, very difficult process for me. Yeah. Yes, please. So I'm wondering, other than our generous donations, and I'd like to, yeah. as the treasurer of the alliance, thank all of you. We collected close to $300 today. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. students from this class have come to work with you, um, and I think there may be others who may be inspired as well. That's, you know, I, I really have to thank you, and as you said before, yeah, sometimes people believe that money has to be big. 300 is a lot. It's a lot because it can maintain a program for a long time, you know. So it's a, it's a lot of money. And it's... The people there really use it in a way, because in a rural setting, actually, it can go a wrong way, because you are talking about the class material, you can pay a teacher, you can do all those kind of stuff, and, or finish that house for whatever. And just next time, or I send it by email, if you can show the, the house that is called Sonoma, that would be nice, so you can see what we are talking about. But what I'm saying, uh, students who are interested, it, it's always a wonderful thing to, uh, uh, when Julie and uh, Becky, yeah. Becky and Julie went with me and it was their first time in Africa and so on, it was really, but I think they got an incredible experience and the people loved them, they gave them the name, they were, you go and you help with any way you can. You, the people there don't necessarily need the money. It's the personal contact. They are missing any kind of social, you know, you have to understand that Rwandan society was a big, big family type of thing where people could spend time here, they could go and eat there. I find people feeding people I sit and eat. I don't have to ask for permission. And suddenly you find yourself as the only one remaining. There's nobody. Even the people who have killed you have left. You know, so you are by yourself if you survive. So. I, I think that people start finding a kind of purpose to life when they have people really who care. So last time I went with the students and they were just doing the, the soccer. And people, I mean, it was the best thing to find people who can play with you. You know, usually they are, when they are by themselves, they are considered as pests. You know, they, you know and sometimes they go to cities, they press, they, you know, they come back. But once they find people, especially who come, who can pray with them, who can, who know their name, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. So when students come, and I've found that the students do a lot more than, I think, 
I don't know. Any any time you are interested, please let me know. And when I go, I can take you or something. I wish I had the money to take people, but it's usually you know. But it's it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for people to connect. And I think also students learn a lot from that kind of connection. Aside from what the people there get, but also the students can uh, connect. You know, we one of the the best thing, like for instance at Brown University. They have a group, one of the requirements for their graduation is to go to, for, to the countries. But they have a whole program going to Rwanda. That's why I was you know, there. But they, they are artists, you know, they, they do all those kind. It's an, you know, for them, they, their identity has shifted when they met Rwanda and they see, they are able to represent those realities. You know, so it's, it's an incredible thing. But people in sociology especially, you can really, it's a breeding ground for whatever you want to study. Yeah. You know, so I, you can go, but also to meet the people and to understand. Sometimes what I lament more is that when people think about what took place in Rwanda and the cruelty and people judge the whole society. It's one of the most beautiful places. And people love people. They, they are, you know, but then I always believe that people see us as you know, savages, and that's not how our society was. But once you are there, you can see the beauty of the country, but also the, the people. That, uh, for me, you know, it's always trying to see how people can see your reality aside from genocide, you know. And society, our society was beautiful. It was really, even now I can't tell you what happened, but that's how it is. Yes, please. No genocide has ever been stopped, you know, in all, all history. My question is, if you guys can talk at all about why nothing was done in, you know, this is very modern, in the 1990s, nothing was, something nothing was done to stop, to stop the killings. And perhaps, Alan, you can speak also from the U.S. government perspective, they're asking you to go in there and survey bodies, why was nothing done to stop it, um, per se? You know, presumably, you know, anything... Well, I... To stop it, you know, Gwandans, Gwandans tried. The prime minister, who was a woman, who is a Hutu woman, tried to stop genocide. And she was killed. <laughs> the few people, the Belgian people who tried to go and protect him were killed. They were dragged in the street. The few UN troops who were there were taken out. They said the situation is so tense, we better get, get out of this, you know, country because the people are going to die. And if you see the images, there's a, when you go to Kigali, especially when you go into the city, there's a big, um, it's an institution where people were trained for, for arts and so on, big one. That's where people came and assembled all the expatriates, put them in cars, and the, the people killing were there. So they were killing them in front of people living in their trucks. You know, and let me tell you, people will tell you that there are people actually who even, you know, took off people from those trucks even when they were. This is not about Rwandans. We are taking our people. And in a way, you know, I do understand. This is really a tough situation when you see someone with machetes. You don't want to die from a machete wound, you know, so people will leave. But during this time, I think there are two things. On one hand, for a long time, like what I was saying, they refused to call it genocide. You know, it was a tribal war. And by all means, in Africa, they happen every day. You go to Sierra Leone, you find a, a war, you go to Liberia, you go to whatever, Congo. So they say, okay. And then you, you were in some Somalia and the Americans were shot. So they are saying, why are we going to die again in this, Amer this Rwandan war? But on the other hand, for the case of Rwanda, I think that people refuse to act uh, and they refused to say what was taking place exactly because they didn't want to act. Because they knew very well genocide was taking place. The reports were going every day. Uh, Dale, who is his friend, was sending the, the information. He was sending the information. We know where the cash of arms are. They are talking about killing these people. 
we'll do that. And if you look at the testimony by the Clinton administration during that time, you'll see uh, she was really, she didn't know what to say. She was saying acts of genocide are taking place, but at this point we can't call it, you know, and the journalist was saying, how many acts of genocide do you need before you can declare it a genocide? Yes. By the time they called it genocide, the people were, you know, there was no one to say. You know, it was that. So, if you ask me, and I, I might be wrong, there were a couple of reasons why people didn't act. Number one, France was also part of the equation. Because of France that was present in Rwanda got a mandate to be the one dealing with Rwanda. So if you find a power within the Security Council saying that they are going to deal with that situation, it's, it's wonderful. You don't even want to do, go there. But France was engaged in genocide. France was the one that was arming the people who were killing the Tutsis. As a matter of fact, you see all the pictures with them, training the inter army. So meaning that you send the power that has been, and, and if you look also at the, the, the events leading to that, they created what they call a safe zone in Rwanda, the zone to require. But it was to protect the killers. You know, all these people who had killed in Rwanda went to uh, that place in Kibeho, where they called the zone of Kitrikwazi. No Tutsi was saved there. Then these people eventually went to Congo. But what we are saying, we had the power already in the country. We had uh, United States that didn't necessarily want to go and again experience what they had experienced in, in uh, Somalia. Uh, you had many things taking place. They didn't want to go and die in, in Rwandan war. And then when the the, 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 the Belgians, the peacekeeping mission, who, who died because they were trying to protect you know, the, the prime minister, they said they are not respecting anything, even the UN troops are being massacred in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, the movements in Belgium, the people were saying, get out our children, we don't want to die in an, in an African war. And it made sense. So there were many different things why, you know, it happened, I think. You know, he can maybe add something because he was there. Probably by the first week of May, I had counted personally probably 35 to 40,000 bodies, 10,000 in Lake Europe and the other 20, mainly in churches, because the Hutu had put out a call for all Tutsi to gather in the churches. Rwanda is 98% Catholic, so 98% of the population gathered in the churches. They were churches after the Tutsi got in. The Hutu said, gotcha. They surrounded them. They hit them with RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades, fire, until they breached the walls. Imagine these churches held they weren't the largest of places in some cases, but they held between an astounding 5,000 people, as in Kibeho, to 10,000 in the cathedral in Chigali, the capital. They pulled them out in Chigali, the capital, the mayor of the town and the Monsignor in his vestments, because the Archbishop had already been killed, Frederick had been killed. These two men would have a hundred or two Tutsi come out. The men, they would take the spike and drive it in the back of their necks and kill the men. The women, they would do incredibly bizarre things to them. I know because I helped bring a girl, Alice, to this country. Who had, had, who had been multiply raped. She had two of them, there were two sisters. One sister had her breasts cut off with machetes. The other had her nipples pulled off with pliers. Yes. This was common. If they did that and they died, they died a merciful death is all I can tell you. I won't go west. But as far as the role of the United States, I was in Rwanda, as I've suggested before, because of the United States government. I had close ties with the National Security Council in Washington, a man named MacArthur Deschauser within the White House. 
I certainly had access to the American embassies in Kinshasa and Kampala. Every two weeks or so I would get out and I would race to our embassies and I would say the same thing time after time by the beginning of May. This has got to be genocide. I had never been in genocide, but when you see nothing but Tutsi, 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 men, women, and children without discrimination, babies on the backs of mothers, the Tutsi had to, the Hutu had to prove something to the Tutsi because the legend is that the Tutsi originated in Ethiopia. And eventually, if they chopped their legs off, the tall Tutsi, which is the impression of people, Tutsis are all seven or eight, 10 feet, 20 feet tall. But uh, uh, they would chop the legs off men, women, and children and throw them in the Kagera River. So they would float down the Kagera into Lake Victoria go around Lake Victoria till they enter the mouth of the Nile and hopefully head home to Ethiopia. But going out of Rwanda into Kampala, the hotels in Kampala were jammed with diplomats, with soldiers, with correspondents. This whole city was packed with people, all Westerners, all desperate to get into the news, not into Rwanda, but somehow get a story or something that would make them look good. I never found these people when I got back to the Rwandese border. I always crossed with my driver, Moses, and my son, and there was never any of this mass of people. But when I would get to the embassy, I would give a report to our American ambassador. His name was not the comedian, Johnny Carson, but our American, black Amer uh, American, he's African-American ambassador, Johnny Carson. I'd say, Johnny, you got to tell the Clinton White House, this is genocide, this is genocide. A friend of mine, Lieutenant General Romeo Dallier, who's seen in Hotel Rwanda, somebody I know, Dallier was also pleading with, through the UN, that this was genocide, although Dallier did not get out of Chigali proper, as far as I know, he stayed in the capital he was convinced that this was genocide. I pleaded, I pleaded, I pleaded, I pleaded. Each time I'd come out, the conference room at our embassy would be filled with more and more important looking people. I would say, please, somebody from this embassy, come with me into Rwanda. I will guarantee you safe clearance in and out. I will not let you get killed, including a special forces colonel. Uh, nothing happened. I got a message while I was flying one day that Bill Clinton was going to speak out on the issue of genocide. And as most of you know, he was a very brilliant, is a very brilliant lawyer, or was a brilliant lawyer, I should say. So I took one of my aircraft and I climbed as high as I could so I could pick up the relay from Washington through Voice of America to the BBC and then bounce down to Africa on the relay system that BBC has. And I was, I was frantic because I was exhausted. I had left two little boys, my son Christian and Morgan, six and eight in the United States. Their mother was dead. I was raising them by myself and there I was in Africa. I'd never gotten over that. But uh, I climbed up as high as I could to hear BBC direct. The president came on BBC and he said something to the effect of that. He said, I have no problems with the word genocide or the issue of genocide. If genocide has occurred in Rwanda, I will be the first to declare it. End of speech, what was missing? After the ifs, the statement of, yes, there is genocide in Rwanda. It devastated me to find that semantics was being played on the backs of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. So uh, as far as the politics go, what can I say? Mr. Clinton did graciously go to Africa 10 years after genocide, 
2004 and finally apologized about 10 years late and about a million people short. I'm not a great fan of Mr. Clinton. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to wrap up. Um, did you have a question? I just wanted to say that there's a very good book that I'm sure you know called The Problem from Hell yes. about the tremendous resistance um, of Western governments to reducing the word genocide because they're international law states that they have to respond. They have to respond. That's what I was hoping to trigger. Join me in thanking our guests.